Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kai Horstman. My claim to fame is that uh, almost 30 years ago, I got a call from my friend Gary Cornell, who said, Kai, we're going to write a Java book. Java did barely existed then. It was in alpha. And I said, Gary, I don't know anything about Java, and neither do you. Um, and so we had to learn it really quickly. We learned Java over Christmas of 1995 to 1996. And um, th that book literally sold a million copies. So <coughs> uh, I still write editions of the book. The 13th edition is now available as a rough cut. Um, should have been available earlier, but the publisher had issues. Um, and I'm working on the 14th edition now. And hopefully, eventually, uh, Valhalla will be in one of these books. All right, so Valhalla is a project. What's a project? There's many projects um, in the JDK. There's a project Amber um, that you may not have heard about. Um, that's just a code name, but it's given us uh, productivity improvements to the language, such as records, pattern matching, string templates, and so on. So there's lots of kind of small to medium scale improvements that are coming to Java through that project. There's project Loom uh, that gives us virtual threads. Virtual threads are super cool. If you have not looked at them, I absolutely encourage you to do that. Um, there's Project Panama that gives us uh, <coughs> a newer version of uh, implementing with foreign code um, that's much more performant than Java native. Um, there's a Project Leiden that's going to give us benefits to, uh, that are kind of like Growl, but that are going to be part of the open JDK as opposed to being a completely separate and different thing. And of course, there's Project Valhalla that gives us uh, value types. Valhalla is supposedly some, some Nordic uh, version of the paradise where the gods are. A little picture of it up here. Um, <coughs> why pictures? Uh, many years ago, I gave a presentation at another conference uh, where the, uh, I had to pre-clear the slides uh, with uh, the conference organizers so that there weren't any, going to be any bad jokes in it or something. And the organizer said, you know, Kai, your slides are really boring. There has to be a picture on every slide. And I didn't know what pictures to put because a lot of the stuff is pretty abstract. And, uh, but now there is a picture on every slide. And so if you're bored with the slides, you can figure out what, why, what the picture means. Um, <coughs> so uh, just a quick refresher. Um, uh, in Java, as you know, we have uh, primitive types and we have references. Ever since Java 1, there have been eight primitive types and everything else is a reference type. Um, and so why are uh, int and, uh, <coughs> and double and so on uh, primitive types? Of course, because of performance that uh, you know, 30 years ago, it would have been unthinkable to say like everything is an object. Um, or it would have been thinkable, but th that's what, what they did. Um, <coughs> and they are different in so many ways. Uh, so primitive types, efficient, flat, there's not, uh, they're not st uh, stored by reference. There's no headers. Any, every object has a header, uh, they don't. Um, equal, equal compares primitives uh, by value and not by identity like it does with references. Um, primitives can be, uh, can't be null. Um, I put a little asterisk in here because that'll uh, be important for us later. Uh, primitives are initialized with zero bits. So when you have a, a double uh, foo, then it's initialized as the number 0.0. .0. Uh, whereas if you have an object reference, of course, it's initialized with, with null, with no object at all. At all. It's different. Um, longer primitives can tear. Um, that's not something that, that we commonly observe nowadays, but back in the olden days, um, when processes typically were 32-bit, when you assigned one double to another in one thread, it could happen, and I don't think that many of us ever ha had to worry about this, but it could happen that another thread would be observing that the first 32 bits were assigned while the second 32 bits were still the old value, um, yeah, which is potentially bad. It's something to be aware of. Um, so the th uh, keep those three starred properties here in mind that they will become important in a few minutes. So um, a couple of notions here. So what you see uh, on the top is how today, um, if we have an array of points, of point objects, how they are stored. Every um, element of the array is, of course, just a pointer. Um, it's a reference to the individual object. Um, that's not really what we would ideally want. It would be nicer um, if we could just store the x and y values, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, as you see in the second picture. Um, today, that's, in Java, that's completely impossible um, because you have to have uniform layout. 
and it's just the way it is. So we're paying with today's uh, implementation of the JVM, we're paying two prices. One is that we don't have flatness, uh, meaning that we have an extra level of indirection for every object, even though we don't really want it. And the other one is what we don't have is what's called density, meaning we have a header for every one of the separate objects that we don't want. It would be so much nicer if we could pack them all, like as you see in the second picture, right next to each other, and if we then did not have to have these unnecessary headers. That is, in a nutshell, what uh, Valhalla uh, uh, is going to promise to give us. So why do we care? Um, <coughs> there are certain classes that are kind of similar in behavior to the primitive types. And we would kind of like to code them up with whatever their behavior is, but we want to have the, the general behavior that we're used to from primitive types. And so the, the catchword of Valhalla has been for 10 years that it codes like a class and it acts like an int. And that really is, in a nutshell, uh, what we want. Why do we want it? It's because, first of all, of performance that why are you not keeping uh, array lists of integers? Because you know intuitively you don't want to have to pay for that extra indirection. You don't want to have to pay for that extra header per object. And so that's why we use primitive types in the first place. We just want to have more of them. And performance really is the key reason to do it. Um, so we save memory. If you don't have to uh, have a header per, uh, per value, then that's less memory used. We also get better locality. When the uh, uh, JVMs were first invented 30 years ago, um, the difference between processor speed and memory speed was nowhere near what it is today. Um, today, we're very concerned about the fact that fetching things from memory is, is super expensive. And if you have to fetch it from different regions from memory, then um, <coughs> you have a huge cache penalty where you, know, you could otherwise do thousands of operations. So having good locality is important. But if you think about the picture of the first uh, picture of the array of points, where you point here and here and here and here and here, then locality was obviously terrible. Whereas if you have them all in one array, that's better. That is a huge win for arrays. Um, also, when you have fewer objects, you have less garbage collection uh, work. And if there's less pressure on the garbage collector, that can only be good. So those are the, the three kinds of performance benefits that we're looking at. And as you, obviously, as you can see, you will uh, be most impacted by those if you have lots of objects that could be represented more efficiently. Another maybe minor benefit is that um, when, when we have, as you'll soon see, when we have these value types, that they act like primitive types also with respect to equal equal. And you, know, you might find that more intuitive that you can use equal equal to compare you know, what should be two values and not two references. And that's in fact the case. Another reason um, why the pressure to do something about uh, values has, has increased since Java 8 is, so it, it used to be that we weren't too concerned about wrappers. When wrappers were introduced in Java 5, people said, yeah, whatever, um, you know, maybe a little wasteful, but how often do you have an array list of integer or uh, objects? Um, and occasionally when there, is a, when there is some wrapping going on in a reflection or something, not that big a deal. Then Java 8 came and we had streams. And then you have the function types, and now you have this inflation of function types. You know, if you uh, th think about in, uh, a predicate on integers, there's now four different ways you can express that. It could be a function integer to Boolean, or a predicate of integer, or an int function of Boolean, or an int predicate. And they're all slightly different. They're not convertible to each other, and that's a stupid pain. So having these, the <coughs> these, uh, these wrappers um, is not fun. We certainly don't want to have more inflation of that um, when, when we have more values. Um, and we want, instead, we want to be able to make it so that the primitive type int is really something that, that is not so different from the type integer as it is today. So we want to unify the, um, the primitives with the, the regular type system. So those are the three motivations um, of the uh, project Valhalla. And of course, the really important motivation is performance. So how is this done? Um, we are given a new concept, um, and that will come actually pretty soon. The, the, there's a jet out that could really hit um, a, uh, a, a preview um, uh, fairly quickly um, that gives us what's called a value class. 
A value class is just like a regular class. Um, it has methods and constructors and everything, but it, does, it gives up one thing, like the person on the right, namely identity. A value class is a class without identity. That means the equal equal method of a value class will not test whether two instances are the same thing in memory. They'll, it'll simply test whether they have the same contents. It'll compare the fields. We'll see details in a minute. Um, same thing with hash code. So you will not be able to tell two instances apart. They may be stored in the same location with a reference. They may be stored in two different locations. They may be flattened out in memory. You don't know. You have no way of knowing where an ob a value object is stored. Um, for that to work, the fields have to be final because otherwise you could have you know, modify one and not the other. And so any class that, uh, I'm sorry, any field that you uh, declare in a value class is implicitly final, just like with records. And so it is up to the, the virtual machine what to do with that information. So the only semantics that you're given as a programmer is that a value class has no identity. The virtual machine then can take advantage of that fact and do whatever optimization it uh, sees fit. It could uh, do uh, any amount of flattening um, or scalarization um, that it chooses. You can't directly tell the virtual machine um, what, what you want it to do. It is entirely up to the, the VM what to do and when to do it. Now, what about records? Um, shouldn't it simply do this thing for records? Well, for historical reasons, records have been in the language now for a while, um, which means that records are regular old classes. In particular, um, they're nullable, and uh, they could have you know, any size, any semantics. And so the decision was made that value classes are different from records. Um, but if you like, you can have a value record. And in fact, m most of the records that people have been uh, declaring over the last few years would probably make very good value records, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, what about equality? So like I said, that um, there's the concept of identity. And uh, in, in Java, it has always been, up to now, that x equals y tests for identical objects. Two objects are identical if they're the same thing in memory, if they were created by the same called a new. Um, and that's always been like that, except, of course, for those eight primitive types. Um, or in the situation where you compare a value that's a primitive type with a wrapped value that's an object, in that case, the, the, uh, the wrapper gets unwrapped and what's inside gets compared. Um, but that's not going to change. Um, that any time that you compare a, a two value objects with equal equal, then they will be compared by their value and not by their identity. After all, they don't have an identity. Um, you don't know how, how those instances are stored. So if I declare the value uh, class point, as I did on the previous slide, and now you have two point instances, um, and <clears throat> when you check that they're equal, then it checks are the x and y components the same. And that's really the only thing it can do, because the virtual machine is totally free to take a point object and instead of storing it in the familiar form as a separate block of memory with an X and a Y component, it could just put them next to each other in a, in a register that's large enough to hold both of them. Um, or if it has an array of them, you know, it could uh, uh, flatten them up like you've seen in the picture. That's, that's up to the VM um, how it does that. There are a couple of wrinkles that, uh, that you'll soon see, but that's the basic idea. Now this equal equal, of course, works with nesting. So here I have a silly example where I have a value record circle that has a radius and a point where the point itself was a value uh, a record or a value class. And then if you check whether the two circles are equal equal to each other, then it checks are the uh, radius equal equal. Um, and um, oh, there's an equal sign missing. Um, and uh, the centers, which are points equal equal, and then it recursively it uses the, uh, the value definition of equal equal. All that stuff is completely automatic. And you'll say, big deal. It just works like that uh, with records, too, with equals. So when you have a record, it builds an automatic equals method. And here, you just get the same thing as equal, equal. You can still call equals if you like. Equals calls equal, equal. <coughs> um, and so you may, if, you, if you're used to uh, using equals, you can do that. Or no, you can call the operator, which saves you a few keystrokes. 
So it's, uh, that's perfectly simple and it's perfectly reasonable. Again, it's a, it's a consequence of the fact that values have no identity. There's a super minor technical wrinkle. Um, as uh, <coughs> There's a, uh, a, a weirdness about equal equals when comparing floating point numbers that you may only remember from a certification exam. It's not something that normally comes up. Um, namely, that if you have two different uh, values that are not a number, they're never equal to each other with equal equal, but they very likely will be equal to each other with this recursive notion. And the other thing is that you will not be able to test the difference between plus and minus zero, uh, which is also a confusing thing. That, um, and they, they, they did the same thing with records, so it'll work exactly the same as with records. Um, now, here's a little a bit of a potential puzzler code. I am making two point objects, P and Q. Um, they have the same, they're called by, uh, they're constructed by two calls to new. Um, notice, by the way, that value uh, instances are also made by new, and it kind of looks like it's going to you know, make a new object somewhere, but it doesn't have to. It just can grab the memory for in whichever way it wants. If it wants flat memory, a long register, then that's its choice. And so you don't really know whether P and Q how they're stored. For all you know is there could be two classical objects um, and they probably will be for a while until the, the JVM's JIT kicks in, but eventually they will be scalarized into uh, these consecutive doubles. And in that case now equal equal of course compares the X and the Y components. Now here I'm going to move them into different objects um, by just you know, casting to object and this is something where the implementation gets a little bit tricky. Now it has to compile it so that the equal equal will do the right thing. So because we don't want a situation where as points they are the same and as objects they are different. So even for objects, the equal equal will now have to look. Are the things to the left and the right of the equal, are they value instances? And then it has to do the value equal equal or otherwise it has to do the object equal equal. So equal equal has now become polymorphic. All right. So um, you may have a bunch of classes in your existing code base, um, and so does the JDK. And so we're kind of wondering, you know, what are good candidates for these value classes? And so, uh, of course, any time that you have like things that are like num numbers, so people sometimes want to have longer longs, 128-bit uh, longs, or longer f uh, floats, 80-bit floats, um, or shorter floats. There's people who use 16-bit floats for some computations. And so right now you can't do that in Java at all, um, but uh, you will be able to do that with, uh, with value types. Same thing with unsigned, right? Right now you can't have an unsigned type. Now, um, don't get too excited. You, you don't get operator overloading. So if you want to do these kind of number types, then you have to deal with cumbersome methods like dot, dot <coughs> add, dot multiply, just like with big integer and with big decimal, but you'll be able to get super good performance. Um, <coughs> So things like you know points or measurements, where you you don't need that extra level of indirection. You have you know, a compact thing of describing uh, numbers. Um, those are good candidates. Currency values, uh, same thing, right? You have the currency itself, maybe as as a, a big decimal or as a packed decimal, and then you have the currency as a whatever th three character abbreviation. Um, date and time. Right. These are clearly values. If you have an instant in time, that's an immutable value. There's no need to pay for an extra level of indirection. Um, think of optional. Right now, what does optional do? Um, it packages a reference to another object that hopefully was never null. An optional of, uh, of a null would be really weird. Um, and it packages that flag to see whether there was something in there or not. And that's, that's completely wasteful. What you really want is you want to have one bit that says, is this thing null or not? And then you want to have the thing in, in there itself without the reference. That would be much better. And um, right now, people shy away from optional because they are worried about the performance hit. hit. And so that would be nice to uh, get that away. There are other things. There's, there's, there's a type either that is you know, one thing or the other that also people are shying away for the same reason, or tr uh, like a try type that gives you either a value or an, or an exception. And those could be nicely packaged as value classes. That's in general, pairs, right? Now people are reluctant to return two things out of a method because how you'd have to package it as an, as an object 
would be a nice value type, or a, a range where you start, have the start and the end. Um, or in general, tuples. Um, and uh, of course, it records. Anything that uh, right now you make into a record, you can probably make into a value record. Inside the JDK, there are also opportunities for using value types. Um, for example, um, when right now in pattern matching, you can uh, pattern match on, on records, but you can't pattern match on, uh, on arbitrary types, um, but there is a move to give them deconstructors like you have in Scala that break down an, uh, an instance into what would have been the construction arguments. Um, but how are they then going to be transported to the right place? Um, you don't want to have to wrap them, which is what Scala right now does, and it's quite slow. Um, this would internally be done with a value type. So um, there's plenty of opportunities for these. They are all kind of in, in a specific corner that we, you might say, well, I don't ever do this. But um, if any kind of library that deals with you know, <coughs> uh, either ob objects that are very short-lived um, or with objects that are stored in, that are aggregated in arrays, um, they do care about this stuff uh, to a great deal. I know they care because sometimes I talk to some uh, people who do some financial wizardry, and their Java programming means that they take all the data and put it into a byte array. They have this humongous byte array just for performance. And then, of course, their Java code looks terrible because they don't take any advantage of any of the things that Java has to offer. They have other reasons why they like Java, but the programming model isn't that. These people are going to be super happy about this. Um, or so, so you would think. They, they're still griping that they, about <coughs> they don't have enough control over what the JVM does with it. Um, but I, I think that's actually it, that the JVM knows what it's doing. All right. So a couple of technical and conceptual differences um, that, as a programmer, uh, we'll have to be aware of when we have these two kinds of classes. Um, there is the, <coughs> uh, the classic classes now. And a, a regular a classic class cannot extend a value class, um, a concrete value class. I'll get to that. That's, that's a limitation for technical reasons. Um, you can have abstract value classes, um, which is, I don't think it's going to happen super often, but here I have an example. So you have an abstract value class, JSON value. And I make it into, an into a value class because I later want to have a concrete value class that extends it. So you have a JSON. Uh, a uh, value record JSON number that extends that abstract class. Um, <coughs> and I can also have a, uh, a concrete uh, identity class, uh, just with, a, uh, with references, the old style, that extends the abstract value class. Like I say, I don't think this is something that, that happens a lot, but it, it is legal and it's, we'll have to remember those, those rules. An abstract value class can even have fields. Um, which for, uh, for a long time they said this, this was not going to be possible, but uh, now it can. Um, value classes can implement interfaces just like records. So if you have the basic idea that a concrete value class is like a record, then uh, that's, that's the right model. And these abstract value classes are a bit of a new thing because you can't have abstract records. Um, but like I say, they're not going to be super common. A value class can never extend an identity class. And if you think about it, um, that's because then inheritance would, would become very hard to control. Um, there's one exception, that the object class, well, if you think about you know, why is object, why don't they just make it into a value class? Um, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, there is a technical reason why we can't say object is, uh, uh, is a value class, but it's going it, to uh, be technically an amorphous class that, of course, every class extends object, and so do value classes. So why can't object be a value class? Because value classes cannot have synchronized methods. Value classes cannot be locked upon. Um, that is, uh, an, an object has inside the header data structure, it has the machinery that you need for synchronization. Every object potentially can, uh, can be uh, a monitor, but that's expensive. You don't want that for if you have 100,000 points in a cloud. You have no interest in synchronizing on any one of them. You don't want to have to pay for, <coughs> uh, for having the synchronization data in each of them. So values um, uh, cannot be used with synchronized. Um, object for historical reasons can. There's someone out there 
who has used an object just as a lock because they haven't heard of, uh, of the Java 5 locks. And so we can't take that away. And so that's why object you know, should be a value class conceptually, an abstract value class if you think about it. You know, object should have always been abstract, but for historical reasons, it's not. All right, so you have now this, these two universes of classes that are quite different in, uh, in these behaviors. There's a wrinkle about construction that's interesting. So if you look at the classic construction sequence that you learned somewhere in Java kindergarten, then you know that when the constructor runs, the first thing it does, it calls super. Um, even if you don't write it, it implicitly calls super on the superclass constructor. If you implement something where you need to invoke the superclass constructor, that has to be the very first statement in the constructor. Um, that's how it's always been. And there are no good technical reasons for, for doing that. Then you set the fields, and that's what you do. For value objects, that's inverted. Um, you first assign to fields in what's called the larval stage before super is invoked. And then super is invoked or you invoke it. And it has a great advantage, and that is that uh, the object only becomes an object that other threads can, uh, can uh, look at when super uh, is invoked. And so no other thread can see what happens before that, and it can't see the object in a partially constructed state. In fact, that is such a good idea that um, now there is a JEP out that is, I think, in Java 23, um, that makes this possible for any class, and it ac is actually a good idea for most classes to do the same thing. Um, and they have to do it now because if you have a value class that has a abstract value superclass, that's the only thing that, where that could happen, is that you need to be able to do just like that by hand, namely assign to the field first, and then call super as the last thing. So you will no longer, in, in a value class, you're not allowed to assign to any field uh, after super is called. Those fields have then become final. You know, all fields are supposed to be final, but you have to have a brief moment where you can mutate them through assignment, and that happens before uh, uh, the object is frozen in, in super. And you know, this is really a good idea for all classes, and uh, with JEP 482, you can do that. All right. Now we're coming to where the story gets sad, so I should put an unhappy face here instead of the silly license plate. Um, and that is null. Um, value type instances can be null, so I can say uh, if I have my value class point, and nothing stops me from assigning null to it. Now, that doesn't really fit our mental model, right? I said, what's the point? It's an X and a Y, very probably like next to each other in a 128-bit value. Um, what about null? Um, then you need to have some way in the, <coughs> in the storage to differentiate um, th the complete absence versus zero and another zero. They're not the same thing. Um, and so you would need an extra bit for it. Or maybe if you were clever with doubles, um, you could find an extra bit somewhere because you know, there's some uh, bit patterns of doubles that are not actually needed. So maybe you could, uh, so a VM could say, you know, one of the many not, not a number values is reserved for, for a null uh, indicator. But generally you should think of null means an extra bit in the binary representation that says, is this sucker null or isn't it? Um, and that's kind of a hassle, of course, because that, that extra bit is not easily found. Um, and so it would be so much nicer if we could say that this value is never null. When I have a point, you know, probably that point is never null. Uh, why would I want to have, if I have a path of points, you know, why would I want to put a null in here? Um, you know, it describes some, some path that someone crawls along. Um, and so you can now indicate that, or soon you will be indicate, uh, able to indicate that um, by saying this is a point exclamation mark. You know, from other languages, there's like a point question mark. That means it could potentially be null. Um, like in, uh, in, in Kotlin, it's like that, right? Types by default don't have null, but if uh, you can do a question mark saying, you know, maybe this is null. In Java, it's too late for that. 30 years too late. You know, many, uh, it was, the decision was made at the beginning of Java that if you have a point, that, that means either an object or it means null. So it still means an object or null, but now it means, uh, now you can say the opposite you can say the thing with an exclamation mark, and that means it's definitely not null. The compiler will check for that. Oh, by the way, this syntax 
um, is somewhat put possible to change this. Um, there's some debate going on right now whether that is the optimal syntax. It's been around for a couple of years, and I think it has staying power, but it, I just want to point this out. Um, so the compiler then is smart enough to trace that. If you now assign a, a null into this variable, it was declared as a point exclamation mark, then it'll say no way. Um, there's also a runtime check, and there has to be a runtime check, because you could try to trick the compiler by assigning your array of point exclamation marks into an array of objects that has always worked in Java. It, has, uh, it needs to continue to work. And now, if, what if you then store um, a, a null into the array of objects, then you need to get a runtime error. And that's how it works. So the arrays have to be instrumented in the virtual machine that they know were they arrays of nullable or of null restricted values. And if they were of null restricted values, then that's no. All right, some boring things about conversions. Um, so you, you would kind of think that not null t is a subtype of t because it's less, right? It means everything but not null. Um, but that's not how it actually works for some technical reasons that uh, I don't want to bore you with. Um, instead, when it says that it, there's a widening conversion from the null restricted type to the regular type and a narrowing conversion that goes the other way around. And that stuff is technical and boring, so I'm not going to go into the details. You can ponder that on the slides if you want to. And that conversion also works with arrays. And again, I don't want to go into the, the weeds with, uh, with that. If we have questions, then I can come back to this. Um, another thing that's to uh, keep your mind fresh here is, um, th and this happens a, a couple of times in the JEP example, so it's a good example to understand. Uh, here I have a node class uh, in a linked list. Um, it carries some data here. I didn't make it generic, so it just carries the data as an object. Um, and I have then a node to the next. Perfectly legal, even as a value type, because values can be null. So I could have a link, a link, another link, and then finally a null to indicate the end. Um, can the virtual machine flatten this? So what happens if I put node exclamation mark here? Um, the virtual machine, um, now actually even the compiler, not even the virtual machine, the, the compiler um, is going to say that can't really work. Because how would it work? If I if it now wanted to flatten it, I try to draw a little picture here on the right, it would have the data, and then it would have a next object that sits right there, not a reference, but the object would be right in there. And then recursively it would have the data, and then another object sitting right in there, and obviously, it can't infinitely flatten this out in memory. And so the compiler will say, if you have a recursive chain of values with a bang, that's, that's a uh, compile time error. So just a little technical wrinkle here. So a value class can't have a null restricted field of its own type, or, and you can't build a chain of, of, of types like that either. It'll check for that. Um, so why do they allow the, the circularity at all? Um, it is kind of a small win to be able to say that if you have a node thing that has a, a data and another pointer, that you can flatten it on the stack. You can't flatten it on, uh, on the heap, but you can, uh, you can flatten it as you uh, uh, have these things around. So it makes sense to say it's, it's, it's a value class. All right, a bit about reflection. Um, as with everything in Java, these null restrictions go away at runtime, um, just, just like with generics. Um, there's no separate class object for point wow. Um, and, but there is some way of reflectively checking it. And again, I'm not going to go into the, the gory details because you're not programming with us tomorrow and those details may, may change. But, um, so you can use some amount of reflection to work with these exclamation mark types. Zero instances. So we talked about this. Primitive types have a zero default. And that's kind of good because if you have an array of new int or new double, it has to know what to fill them with. What if I have an array of new points? Um, let me skip this for a second. If I have an array of new point, it has to know what to do with each of the point values. And so you would say, well, can't I just flood them all with zeros? And then they become all zeros themselves recursively. And that generally is the right thing, but there are a few types where the zero default is not appropriate, such as local date. Uh, we don't really know what a local date of zero would be because I don't even remember what the in internal rep representation is. 
um, but it probably would not be a good default. And so they make it so that a class has to, a value class, has to opt in into the zero defaultness with a thing where it says um, implicit constructor. By saying I have an implicit constructor, that means I'm perfectly happy to be flooded with zeros. That's all. Um, probably most value classes will want this. The syntax is still in flux. Um, they may still decide that maybe a class needs to declare the opposite or that you know, this kind of icky looking constructor is, uh, is going to be different. They might use an annotation. Who knows? Um, so more technical stuff here that we don't care. Um, you can only uh, form an array. Um, oops, there's an, uh, there's an, uh, there should be an array, not a bang. Um, uh, when there is an implicit constructor. That's the whole point. Um, there's more syntax here about enhanced primitive boxing. Sorry about the, the image um, that I will skip because it's again super technical. Um, that, uh, yeah. Um, and about covariant arrays that I will also skip. And this one here. So um, because I want to get to a couple of more of these more interesting points. Um, atomic updates. That's the thing with tearing um, that um, small values have to always been updated atomically, but long ones could tear. They haven't recently because these days all processors can deal with 64-bit values. But what if you have a point? The 128-bit values. Maybe your processor can't handle that. Um, and so th the longer these flattened values get, the, the more you have to worry about that. And so by default, value type updates are made to be atomic. So if you have a, a longish thing, then the VM will put in synchronization instructions in there that make sure that no one can see the object until it is fully built, because the Java default, uh, they argue, should be that it doesn't do anything that's weird and unsafe. And if you don't care uh, about that guarantee, if you're willing to, to have the risk and, as the benefit, have some not insubstantial cost savings, then the, one would have to uh, have one's value type implement this marker interface. Um, so those are, now you've seen the three knobs that you need to, to worry about. Um, is something nullable? Is something zero initializable? initializable and is it terrible? The syntax for the, the, these three with the bang, with the exclamation mark, with the, uh, with the implicit constructor, and here with this marker interface are subject to change. Um, and the, the last two may well change, but those are the, the basic three things that you need to worry about. Um, all right. Um, when you migrate, uh, so the, the JVM will migrate anything that today is, well, they'll migrate some, um, <coughs> uh, I shouldn't say that. In the first uh, phase, they will migrate specific things. All the wrappers, integer double, will become value types, even though they're not so declared as will optional, hooray, and any records will be, um, so no, sorry, the, the, the super type records, not the individual records. Um, and they'll all be uh, nullable, no, sorry, zero initializable. Um, you should do the same, you should look at your classes, and whenever you have these kind of dust data classes, whether as records or as the, the trivial classes, you know, think of them as probably good candidates for values. And that's, Keep those complex rules for value class inheritance in mind as you do that migration. Um, you know, be sure that that equal equal hash code that you're happy with the new semantics. You probably will be um, when you have these kind of value describing classes. And you know, maybe you need to worry about a security impact because equal equal now compares by fields. Maybe some uh, that's a little bit less safe than uh, not being able to peek into the object at all. Um, I don't know if that's a big concern, but they were concerned about it somewhere. All right, oh yeah, and not synchronized. But I mean, how often do you synchronize on an integer? I hope never. Or on, a, on, on another small object. Um, I mean, these days it's best probably not to use synchronized in the first place. Um, generics are a problem, and that's really pretty much all that you need to remember at this point. Um, and the problem is the following, that now uh, we, sh we will be able to do an array list of, of int. Int is a synonym for integer with a bang. Um, and how is that going to work in bytecodes? What you want is that you want a an, 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 an native int array. You don't want, of course, you don't want to have a, or it could be a flattened array of integer bang objects, 
um, but it, it needs to be efficient and with, without interaction. And so it's not so clear how these, these things work today. So there's, that's still a research project, and there's endless discussion on how one should do these kinds of things. Also, the type system gets confusing. Um, and um, it gets confusing with nullability. If I have a map from string to int, then um, the get method can't return null, of course, but where do you put the, the null checks? Um, because if generic code is written once, um, so the question is exactly how do you specialize code for flattened types and for non-nullness? Um, and there are JEPs out there that describe that, but more in, in hopeful terms than in, in actual ones. Um, overloading gets more complex. So the strategy is that we will, um, within a, a shorter time frame, get what's called universal generics, where all of these things will work with both primitive and uh, <coughs> with both value and reference types, but they may not be super efficient. And eventually, there'll be some way that more efficient code gets generated, what's called specialized generics, where there's different code generated for, for values and for references. But we are some, some way away from that. So just a couple of history notes. Valhalla was, is, is 10 years old. It is the oldest non-delivered project out there um, because it is complex. Um, and so when you look at some older blogs, you'll find all sorts of things. There used to be different bytecodes that started with L for lazy, and uh, we still have those, right? And Q for quick, they said. But those bytecodes have gone away. So now there's only one kind of bytecode for both values and references, and it's up to the JVM. There used to be specialized bytecodes to construct value types. They are no longer gone. The surface syntax has changed all the time. So um, you'll see older blogs with an inline keyword instead of value. Um, and so now the value keyword seems stable. I've seen it now for many years, and um, so we'll, we're sure to see that. I think that the, the, the bang is, uh, is what it's going to be. Um, the, the other one, the other syntax you know, is definitely in flux. Generics is in flux. You'll see all sorts of amusing constructs with different kind of type variables, and to just bear that in mind that um, we're, go we're not going to see those uh, that, that soon, so maybe in another 10 years. Um, that I'll be here and give this talk again. All right. Um, just, um, you can build the thing yourself. Um, there is an outdated build. Don't use it. Um, it's like two or three years old, and it's completely out outdated. If you just want to do some simple experiment, there is a sandbox that Mark Hoffman has that, that you can play with. Um, you can otherwise build it, and it's easy enough. Um, it's, uh, if, if you have Linux, it, it builds like in 20 minutes. Um, um, to run it, again, I'm not going to go into the, the details right now. The current prototype supports the value class syntax. Um, you have to run enable preview, of course. Um, and the, the phase two features, meaning um, uh, the, the bang and the, the zero default and the terrorability, you need some weird annotations uh, for that. Um, so if you wanted to experiment, download the slides and look at these annotations. Um, and then you can start experimenting. So, um, and there's crazy flags you need. Uh, just, I just kept, kept them on the slides and in the unlikely case, one of you wants to do that. So I've, as a thing that I did for some benchmarking, I have, I have points and how can you do some benchmark with points? You take a point and then you perturb it a little bit and then you keep doing that. It's called Brownian motion in physics. And it's a, uh, an amusing fact that even though you would think that the, the randomly generated movements cancel each other out, the point will move on average by uh, a, a well-determined uh, amount. Um, so you can run these experiments. You can do benchmarks with it. And uh, <coughs> um, when I ran the benchmarks, um, and the slides contain some, some boring information on how to do that, um, at, at first, I got a crazily good result where without um, Valhalla, the, uh, I had like an array with 100 million points. Uh, no, not an array. I simply took a point and transformed it 100 million times, and it took 34 uh, million, uh, milliseconds um, to, to do that 100 million iterations. And with value types, it took like nothing. So that is not typical, of course. Um, and I looked at it later um, just to see why, and I'll show you in the next slide uh, what I did. So you can't expect that. Uh, when I, once I got it to a more normal conditions, then Valhalla was twice as fast in this situation. 
Um, but I've seen other benchmarks where it was like 10 times as fast or something else. It really totally depends on your load. Um, so um, if you think that you want to jump on the Valhalla bandwagon uh, soon, then you will want to experiment with these benchmarks to see what it means for you because that will really be very different for everyone. And so when I saw these benchmarks, I say, well, why can it be like a, a, a million times faster? And so then it's kind of useful to be able to look at the, the jitted code. And so again, I have the instructions on the slide for those of you who want to see this. Um, and you can uh, uh, <coughs> uh, follow the instructions, look at the jitted images, look at the byte codes that are generated. And in the, in the example that I had, I could see that uh, one of them was heavily vectorized. The other one actually had real method calls to get the fields. And of course, that'll be a dramatic difference in performance. I can also look at the memory consumption here. Sorry about the image. Um, and uh, so if, if you just look at it with J command, and when I just did that, um, it didn't work out for me at all. For some reason, the current build has a bug where it does not flatten an array of points. Um, but you can observe that, and so that's, uh, that's what you will need to do when you get uh, like an alpha build to see you know, where it is right now. And um, earlier and later, you were able to see the flattened array. Uh, earlier, we were able to see the flattened array. I'm sure you know, within weeks when we'll be able to see them again, just not today. All right. Um, so there's a list of further reading on the slide. And so in con con conclusion, after 10 years, you know, this may come to... Uh, JVM knew you real soon now, within a few months, within a few years, who can tell? Um, but probably sooner rather than later. And some workloads will see such significant improvements that you will probably want to check it out. Um, and so flattening is the key. So these null restrictions will have to work. Um, and the other benefit that you then m m might see is you know, that reasoning about primitive types will become more uniform, not easier, but certainly uh, more uniform. The detail rules are going to be complex, so you can have puzzlers in, on your uh, Friday lunches. Um, and generics will come slowly, slowly. Um, and so it's going to be a long way before list angle bracket int does what we want it to do. Um, but yeah, benchmark away when, when you're interested before you decide to, to take the jump. This is a complex technology in the VM, um, but, uh, and maybe somewhat specialized, but it's obviously useful. So that gives me one minute for Q&A. Um. Okay, the idea is that if you don't have, like, if you're too shy to ask questions, maybe afterwards we can... Yes, so, yeah, ask me afterwards. Um, also, let me just put the, the first slide because it has the URL for the slides if you want to look at the slides in detail. Uh, I've packed much more information on there than you can talk about. And you have my email, I trust. Um, I'm easy to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is. And don't hesitate to send me an email or to just you know, grab me in, in the hallway. Um, well, thank you very much.